Hi, thank you so much for coming. I'm excited to speak with you. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? I'm good, thank you. All right, so we could just get right on and get started. Okay, so for our first question, it's access to safe and affordable re reproductive health care has been an ongoing challenge across the world, especially in the U.S. What are the potential consequences of limited access to reproductive health care, such as contraception, abortions, etc., on both individual well-being and broader societal outcomes? Well, thank you for that question and for phrasing it in that way, because I think, you know, Angela and Vari have raised really good points about how devastating really the fall of Roe was for all of us over the past year. But it is really important to remember that for so many people across our country for many, many years and generations, it has been too hard to access sexual and reproductive health care. So while we've seen a lot of change and really a lot of energy over the past year of people really starting to engage in this issue, it really is a long fight that we've been a part of of trying to make sure that people have sexual and reproductive health and access. Um, and to your question as to why it's so important, it is a fundamental part of who we are and how we drive who we become as adults um, from, from very young ages. So I think it, it starts not only as a rights issue in terms of what it is that you can control about your own body and your own future, and it's also a healthcare issue. Um, you know, it is, I'm now the mother of two kids and I can tell you pregnancy is absolutely a healthcare condition. Um, it does a lot to your body. And so being able to make that decision on your terms and with your own health risks in mind is so, so important. So without that access, you don't really know what you're, what you're getting into. So it's rights, it's health, and it's also really an economic issue. Um, so for so many people, it is just key to being able to have a job, have a family, all of these things are so interconnected. So it touches really every part of our lives. Um, I actually just saw some polling earlier today about college age um, people. And um, what the polling showed was that for over, I believe 75% of people who are considering what college they wanna go to, they wanna go to a place where they know they'll have access to sexual and reproductive health and abortion. So this is a part of decisions that people are making every single day and, and really big decisions in their lives. Wow, especially that poll, that is a really big eye opener for me. And yeah, I totally agree. That was an awesome answer. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So our second question is, what are some of the major barriers or challenges that marginalized communities face in accessing contraception? How can these barriers be addressed to ensure equitable access for all? Yeah, so the way these, these bans on healthcare impact people is, is really, as you said, it, it hits the marginalized people first. So historically, people of color, people who face systemic racism, systemic sexism, all of those things, um, people with disabilities, LGBTQI people, um, native people, immigrants, everyone who has additional barriers to accessing healthcare, it impacts them even more. So some of the things that you really see are economic barriers. If you don't have money to get the health care that you need, to get the se sexual and reproductive health care that you need, it's going to be out of reach for you. Logistics can be a really challenging thing. I was just um, at one of our clinics in Illinois where they have a regional logistics center, and they have people who their full-time job is to talk to people on the phone about how they can get to the clinic. You know, what is it that they need to understand some of those dynamics and get themselves, you know, the health care that they need. Um, so there can be a variety of barriers. There can even be barriers when it comes to healthcare providers. Um, our country has a lot of refusal laws that allow providers to basically just say, no, it's against my belief to let you have this healthcare. And, and that can be a real barrier if that's the first healthcare provider you talk to and you think, because this person told me I can't have it, maybe I don't have this right. So it can be you know, all sorts of barriers that, that exist. And one of the things that can be really impactful when we're thinking about how to address these barriers, the way that I think about it is making sure that people have access to healthcare where it meets them. So one thing that my organization has worked a lot on when it comes to the Affordable, Affordable Care Act, which was something that 
I think for most of you, have, has, you've lived with, you, you know the Affordable Care Act. Um, when I was in college, it was something that was being talked about. People were talking about health care reform as like a new thing that we're going to do, and it was, it was a really big deal. And it's still a really big deal. One of the big things that was a part of it that people have really, really liked is cost-free birth control. Um, and so I remember the first time I got to go and get my free birth control. It was amazing. It was so easy. But what we're seeing happening is that insurance companies, other people are saying, wait, I don't think that you should get that health, you should get that particular form of birth control. Even if you've talked to your doctor, your, you and your doctor have decided that this is what is best for you, we're still seeing barriers. So we're really working hard to make sure that those insurance companies and others can't say that, can't refuse you that care. Um, yeah, it's really important, it's really important. Um, but not everyone has access to private health insurance. So it's also really important to make sure that Medicaid is covering birth control. And it's also really important to try to get more options, including over-the-counter options for oral contraceptives. So that's another thing that's happening right now. Later this summer, um, the FDA, a federal agency, will decide whether the first over-the-counter product for oral contraceptives can come onto the market. And that could be a really big deal for people who don't have insurance. Um, so all of these things, trying to get involved in making sure that, that there are fewer barriers, whether it's economic, whether it's healthcare, whatever it is, we gotta try to break down those barriers and bring contraceptives and healthcare to people where they are. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that is, that's crazy. Yeah, it makes sense. And I do believe that whether the FDA approves it or not, for them to be sold over the counter, that will be a big deal. And that will kind of set the tone for what's to come. And that's why we do have a lot of barriers that intersect with other barriers we may already have had, like you said, race, um, gender. Everyone has certain barriers. So in order to get over the ones we have, plus the ones that are now coming on to us with all these changes, we have to stick together so we could break them down. Because one person isn't enough. We have to make a statement and make a stand. That's an excellent point. Thank you. All right, so our third question is, Individuals who identify as part of the LGBTQIA community often face unique challenges when it comes to reproductive health care and access to contraception. How can we ensure that the rights and needs of individuals within the community, particularly trans youth, are fully addressed and included within the framework of reproductive rights and access to reproductive health care? That's an excellent question. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think is foremost of importance is to really make sure that the language that we're talking about these things is inclusive and it's intersectional. Um, I think for some people it can seem like a small thing or a silly thing, but it really is fundamental for people to feel like they are recognized, that they are welcome, and that they can trust the healthcare providers they're trying to, to access. So I'm really proud that over 400 of our health centers offer gender-affirming care. And that has been really important for people. It's to make sure that people show up no matter where their, their background is, that they can see themselves in the care that's being offered, that it's not just for people that identify in a certain way or present in a certain way. And I am so proud of our clinics for doing that work. Yeah, that is amazing. And yeah, I totally agree. We also have to have open arms for anybody and everybody because in certain situations, we all probably felt either left out or unwelcomed once, even if it was in like a kindergarten class. So we know how it feels. So people already go through enough as it is. So if we show open arms, support, we can make everybody a lot more comfortable and we could start with the real changes and change making. All right, so I think we have time for one more question. And this is a two-part question. So the first part is, how can education and awareness campaigns contribute to improving reproductive rights, gender equality, and access to contraception? Could you share some of the key initiatives or programs that Planned Parenthood has undertaken in recent years? Sure, well, everything that we talked about in terms of access to healthcare, um, you know, barriers, breaking them down, none of that really matters if people don't know what's available to them. They, they don't know their rights. They don't know what's in their communities. Um, so really, the education is a key, key component of making all of this happen. So one of the things that we really try to make sure is that our resources are available online, that they can be 
in places available to everyone. Um, but there's a second part of that too, that a lot of our resources are developed really on the local level. So it's, it's a combination of both really broad accessibility and also making sure that, you know, for people on the ground that they are hearing from people in their communities, that they understand what is available to them and that we try to make sure that that is happening. So one, one program that has been really helpful to on the federal level is the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program. And they just did a, a new round of grants and I think um, at least a handful of our centers got grants to be able to help find evidence-based methods that work for helping prevent unwanted teen pregnancies. And one of the things that they do is they look at not only new programs, but also replicating those programs. So can we replicate them in different communities? Can we replicate them for different populations? And, and how do, can we know what works? And then we can build on that knowledge and ho hopefully get people the health care that they need. Wow, that is amazing stuff. That's really inspiring to hear. And yeah, I also believe sometimes there's situations where you wanna make a change, but you can't directly do it. So spreading education about that topic is one of the best ways to get more attention on it and to get a lot more support. So yeah, that's awesome. And yeah, so um, I think we are out of time, but I really appreciate you coming to talk to me and it's been amazing, and I feel like I got a lot more information than when I walked up on this stage with. So I really appreciate that. Absolutely, and thank you for having me. And I, I just wanna say it's so great to be in this room with all this wonderful energy and seeing so many people who are committed to moving forward and making a better future for all of us. So I just really appreciate you in this conversation and, and really all of you for being here today. Woo!